For those of you who are new to this workshop, the purpose of this workshop is to really talk about the subjects that GAI is uh, supporting for research to people from other domains of expertise so that we can really have this conversation and pursue the vision and mission of GAI. And one of them is to push our research capabilities beyond the normal domains of expertise that we are used to and, and our comfort zone. So we want to pursue integrative research and really take to the next level of thought leadership where we can find solutions to problems that are critical to Asia. GAI was set up in September 2009 by the President. Now I'll request him to introduce to you, you what his vision and thinking about GAI is so that it will set the context for today's workshop. Today's workshop has, as Priyanka mentioned, two parts, uh, the presentations, discussions, followed by lunch. Afternoon, we're going to also discuss the five-year research agenda for GAI. We did have that discussion in the first uh, meeting and we have uh, proceeded further. We had an internal small group meeting on the 29th of July and we have actually prepared a few pages of the draft of the research agenda. So we are hoping that today's afternoon we'll be able to have more substantive discussions on the research agenda and hopefully perhaps complete the draft and circulate it for comments uh, from all the uh, associates and the MC members and finalize it for implementation later on. Thank you very much and I now welcome our president to deliver his welcome remarks. Uh, good morning. Uh, I hope you pardon me if I uh, just sit down and speak uh, because I think this is an informal meeting. First, to uh, welcome you warmly to this uh, workshop and uh, to thank you for your interest and also, I'm sure, your contributions to the discussions. Uh, pres university presidents tend to be a bit repetitive, so if you heard what I'm going to say, uh, just uh, excuse me. Uh, but I see some uh, new faces uh, and I thought it might be useful for me to take a couple of minutes just to recap uh, why uh, we started uh, the GAI and what we hope to achieve, and uh, also what perhaps uh, we hope we'll be able to um, provide uh, a valuable uh, service to, to our faculty members, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, the ones in the audience today. So first, uh, the idea of the GAI really is uh, to try to marry a gap. Uh, and, uh, and the gap is, uh, or to try and bridge a gap, and, and the gap is, uh, uh, in my mind, at least, is set up as follows. We have uh, uh, a very large number of people in NUS doing very good work in many areas of research, uh, many of which are highly relevant to issues and challenges in Asia as it develops and grows. At the same time, uh, what we do realize, of course, is that uh, many of the most important challenges and problems for Asia whether they are uh, issues associated with the growth or the unintended adverse effects of that growth, many of these problems are highly complex and they uh, cross over many, many domains of knowledge and expertise. And so the question is, how do we actually create uh, perhaps a new platform which would allow researchers in the NUS uh, to um, work together in ways that would satisfy their own need to do uh, rigorous and deep research in areas of discipline while bringing them into conversation and interaction with uh, researchers working in somewhat associated areas uh, so that beyond the work that you are pursuing, you are able also perhaps to bring this work together to enhance our understanding of the interactions between the issues that uh, contribute to the complex problems uh, that are particularly important to Asia. So in, in that way, uh, the GAI is a sort of a new uh, type of research organization and model that we hope will be able to address these gaps. Now, uh, what I've just said is, uh, of course, highly conceptual. And uh, later on, uh, I know that Citram, uh, our inaugural director, will be sharing some specific examples that would hopefully give uh, more flesh to what I've just said. So the, the specific uh, roles that GI uh, hopes to be able to play uh, are uh, at least threefold. Uh, one, uh, really, it uh, tries to play a convening role. Uh, in other words, it tries to bring together uh, researchers who are working in areas that uh, may have some interactions, which may have some 
common uh, areas of interest and uh, which, uh, for which uh, uh, a conversation between researchers in these areas might be productive. And uh, so it does so through these workshops as well as in the speaker series and the activities uh, that it organizes. So the so convening role, I think, is a very important one and we should not uh, underestimate the potential value of uh, such a role. Uh, the next role it, it tries to play uh, really is a funding role, an internal funding role. But uh, the funding that uh, uh, GAI is deploying uh, is uh, being used in somewhat different ways from the conventional uh, types of funding models that we see. In a conventional model, you put in an application. If you're successful, you get a grant, you do your research, and then when you finish, probably before you finish, you write lots of reports to satisfy the funding agencies. Uh, and then after that, uh, you go on to the next uh, research grant. Uh, you build up a corpus of research. Uh, GAI uh, is a little bit different because uh, it uh, tries to uh, focus on a number of areas, uh, three themes that have been uh, uh, derived, identified through the uh, collective ideas of uh, many faculty. And uh, it therefore uh, is a call for proposal on these themes. The call for proposal tries to bring together researchers from different disciplines uh, with good ideas uh, that address uh, specific issues within that. Uh, but it's got two other, uh, I think, quite uh, distinctive and I think uh, potentially useful uh, aspects to the funding that it gives. First, uh, uh, it, uh, GAI actually convenes workshops like this for uh, researchers uh, who have been successful in their grant applications to talk about their projects and uh, understand that the first workshop was actually extremely useful uh, for uh, the uh, successful applicants uh, as well as uh, for those who are participating. And uh, so this uh, kind of enrichment of ideas uh, by exposing at a very, very early stage to a wider audience, I think it's a, a interesting and uh, I feel a potentially very useful aspect of GI's work. The second is that uh, our intention is that as researchers with, uh, who are being funded by GI pursue their research, uh, we want to also have uh, regular uh, occasions and workshops where they can share their data uh, in the hope that there will be uh, some interesting new areas, or ideas that uh, they feel that together they could pursue. Now this is not compulsory, uh, but uh, it is uh, quite likely that this could occur spontaneously. And GAI uh, can extend uh, add-on funding or follow-through funding to allow such research, new research proposals to be pursued. So if you think about it in a way, uh, GAI therefore is, we hope, will be a more uh, responsive uh, funding mode that would allow uh, fresh ideas that come from uh, groups that are pursuing research projects funded by GRI to extend this research into logical areas uh, based on their interactions together. This is all an experiment. Uh, I guess in uh, five years' time we'll know whether this experiment is useful, but I think it's, uh, it looks very promising to me. The third role that GAI uh, seeks to play is really uh, a role that goes beyond uh, the research projects that it uh, funds. It uh, works together with the other research clusters, the finance and risk management cluster. Uh, we have uh, Deng Yongheng here from finance, uh, aging, uh, sustainability, uh, and uh, looks at uh, a small number of uh, large-scale research projects that crosses between clusters and uh, raising funding uh, for us to uh, support these. Uh, and finally, uh, GI can also play a role uh, as a common interface for external agencies. And uh, later on, uh, CITRAM will also be uh, brief briefing you on uh, a, a grant that we have uh, recently secured from uh, GlaxoSmithKline EDB Foundation. Uh, which uh, will provide $17 million of uh, funding to uh, NUS through GAI uh, to uh, pursue research and also deliver education in health policy, health administration, and health financing. Now, uh, one of the reasons why we were able to secure this grant was because uh, we had a common interface which could integrate between, between different groups within NUS to pursue uh, a uh, project which you thought was well aligned with what GAI and NUS was interested to doing. 
And uh, I think this is going to be an increasingly important and competitive advantage for NUS because uh, there are many agencies looking uh, to engage university in research, but typically what they want is uh, uh, comprises, will have to involve expertise distributed through many departments in university, and uh, these agencies, in a sense, have to do their self-integration. They have to work through the uh, communications, the politics uh, of uh, dealing with different groups within the university. So GAI, uh, uh, I think through the NIHA initiative, has achieved what I would uh, consider proof of principle, that uh, GAI can add value to this uh, process uh, by securing a large-scale grant, which uh, would then benefit many researchers in uh, NUS. Finally, uh, how would I personally assess uh, if GI were successful or not in, say, five years' time. I think I want to uh, reiterate a point I made before, which is that uh, GI is a means. It is not an end. It's a means, not an end. It is a means for our faculty to do even more groundbreaking work. It's a means for our university to become even more competitive uh, for external funding. And uh, I hope it will be a means by which we differentiate ourselves from the many, many different research groups all around the world pursuing research uh, themes similar to ours. So what does that boil down in concrete terms? I, I think uh, GAI ought to help our faculty, uh, uh, individuals like yourself, to do even better work, uh, pr produce even higher impact research publications in the journals that uh, you you are uh, you deem to be the most prestigious. I think that would be a very important goal for us to achieve. At the same time, I hope that even as we achieve that goal, by bringing together researchers from many different fields, but working in somewhat associated areas, we'll be able to tap on your expertise and to build a more holistic understanding of uh, the issues that are most important to Asia and that uh, this could then take the form of uh, conferences, monographs, uh, as well as uh, review publications that uh, hopefully will provide fresh uh, and innovative insights into these issues. Uh, we uh, obviously uh, hope that we'll be able to uh, then uh, be very attractive to uh, uh, top faculty uh, from around the world uh, to either join us or to collaborate with uh, researchers within uh, NUS through GAI, uh, as well as uh, in time to attract uh, top PhD students. Uh, I think in a later phase of GAI, when we have got the research programs running well, uh, there could well be a good time to consider introducing PhD students into the GAI type of uh, environment. And finally, I. I, I very much hope that if we are able to achieve all that, then through uh, GI's work uh, and the work of other of the other research clusters, that we can then uh, give NUS a very very distinctive prominence as a centre which is uh, fully global, applying global standards, using globally accepted and innovative methodologies, uh, but at the same time uh, making use of these to shed very important insights into some of the most critical issues for Asia and uh, to through that to achieve thought leadership uh, in these areas. So this uh, sounds like a pretty uh, ambitious uh, agenda. Uh, we are uh, busy raising money to achieve this. Uh, uh, there is uh, some very promising uh, developments in terms of uh, different sources of funding both from government as well as from philanthropy. Uh, but I, I think this initial $70 million from uh, GSK EDB is a strong indication that uh, uh, people are betting on us. So <laughs> I think uh, they, they, like us, uh, think that we're on the right track. So with that, uh, I will uh, stop down here. And thank you once again, uh, and look forward very much to your uh, active participation in this uh, Workshop. I, I, I do apologize that I uh, am unable to join you for the workshop because I have to go down to MOE to see the minister uh, shortly afterwards. Uh, but I'm sure that, uh, in fact, uh, you'll have a fantastic workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Tan. 
I would now like to invite Professor Showalter to please say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, and I'd like to add my welcome to the ones you've already heard uh, to this part two, really, of a workshop, the first part of which we had uh, in June, and which I think we all believe was very successful and, and very interactive, and we're counting on the same sort of activity going on today. I, to, to underscore some things that President said, I'd, I'd like to uh, repeat a story that I gave at the June workshop that goes back uh, to a statement made by a man named Clark Kerr, who uh, in the U.S. probably was the most influential university president of the last 50 years. He was the first chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley when the state of California decided to have a multi-campus system and uh, was to a large degree responsible for much of Berkeley's rise to prominence uh, as a truly world-class institution and then later became president of the whole UC system. He was a great writer, uh, oftentimes uh, spoke about the, the roles of universities, but he also had a great sense of humor and, and was a quick wit. And uh, at one point, someone was asking him just exactly what a university was. And uh, apparently he got a little bit impatient and he said, well, I'll tell you what a university faculty is. It's a group of absolutely individual entrepreneurs going off doing their own thing. They happen to be united by a common parking problem. And I think that says something about how audacious this GAI concept is. We're, we're going to challenge that notion of a common parking problem and uh, hopefully achieve people working across disciplines, uh, some of that indeed does go on at this institution already, but uh, we feel that through GAI we can do much, much more, and we were encouraged at the first session of this workshop that there were proofs of principle that that can be done. I think the, the two topics we're going to hear about today are particularly interesting, uh, one of them having to do with the technological landscape and, and what that means in the broader context of a city or even a city-state like Singapore. It's, it's hard for me to imagine um, a topic that could be much more relevant to Singapore itself. All we have to do is look out the window over towards One North and, and see what Singapore's uh, aims have been in this direction. But I think the whole world is asking the question, how does that relate? Uh, does, does an Athens really make for a Venice, uh, or are they two separate things? Uh, does the concept apply in, in today's economy and, and in the global sense? Uh, that's being asked in Singapore. It's certainly being asked in the United States. It's being asked uh, in China and other countries as well. So I think this is a highly relevant topic, uh, very timely to be considering at this point, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. The other uh, topic we're going to hear about today that has to do with such things as sustainability of cities, and, and I was struck in, in particular by one aspect of the abstract. Um, as with uh, many of you, I did my term in, in the uh, military uh, at the very bottom end of the, the rung uh, some years ago, and, and I learned from that that you want to read what the generals are saying but you want to pay particular attention to what the lieutenants and captains are telling you to do. And sometimes there seems to be very little correlation between the two. I think in this second address and project, we're going to hear something about how aligned or how misaligned those two might be when it comes to policies uh, for cities. What, what is the leadership saying and, and what is the, the person on the street who's living in the city saying that, too, is, is highly relevant, not only to Singapore, but um, to, I think, all cities, and particularly the, the cities that are changing so rapidly today in Asia. Uh, I would like to underscore the importance of cross-discussion. Uh, it's, a, it's a major purpose of this gathering, so that we've allowed plenty of time for discussion. Uh, I would like to amend just slightly something that Priyanka said where she said the presentations would be approximately 30 minutes. The presentations will be no more than 30 minutes. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we have ample time for discussion, uh, at, at least 15 or 20 minutes for discussion after each presentation. And uh, as I said before, those discussions were lively and very informative uh, in the first session, and I'm sure they will be the same this time also. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, give the podium back to Priyanka, who's going to tell us how we proceed with uh, learning something about Nina. Um, thank you, sir. Before we begin the first presentation, we have a short presentation on NIHA, which is a GAI project that Professor Tan mentioned about earlier. Um, we feel it's an excellent example of cross-disciplinary and multi-faculty work at GAI. Um, I'd like to invite Eti Bhaskar to please say a few words about it. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, Professor Tan mentioned a lot about uh, NUSGAI in great detail. I'm going to give NIHA as an example of an initiative taken by uh, NUSGAI. As we can see, NIHA stands for NUS Initiative to Improve Health in Asia. This program has come into being because of the Galaxy Smith Klein Beecham and Economic Development Board's Trust Fund, which has around $1.50 million uh, in its fund, and they decided to give around $17 million for the NIHA project. So through this NIHA project, we uh, aim to achieve two objectives. One of them would be to contribute to the thinking and policy formulation process in whole of the Asia. So uh, in this, we are going to focus on the research areas in Asia so that NUS GAI can contribute into the formulation of health policies to the relevant countries. The second objective is to make Singapore as a hub so that Singapore can bring together researchers and universities together and can offer solutions for policy formulation for the uh, countries of the region. In order to achieve these objectives, we have, we have a plan which is the medium term research agenda for NIHA. This is similar to the NUSGAI medium term research agenda. So for the NIHA project, this agenda would be for around five years. Some of the areas that we would be looking into are, as illustrated on this slide, in comparative health systems, healthcare financing, but they would not be limited to these topics and would expand gradually. So the whole aim through this research is to have solutions which would be applicable to the region and they would be um, more focused for the problems which are within the region. So we have two objectives for NIHA project. We have a plan of how we are going to approach this. And NIHA has taken up three areas on which it would be focusing. The first would be the forum, which will be a high level forum. Here, people uh, from the policy making level, from NGOs, private sector, and from um, the civil society would be, would be invited for this forum so that they can come together and NUSGAI and other uh, NUSGAI can understand the problems much better so that they can understand what are the research areas into which the university should look into. So with the research agenda in mind and with this high level forum which we will soon be having in November, we aim to have a streamlined research which is the second area in which we will be looking into. We, we will be having a research uh, area as Professor Tan has already mentioned that we are trying to bring together researchers which are working within NUS. Professor Sitaram mentioned that we, we are trying to push boundaries of research. So this research would be integrative, uh, cross-cluster, cross-disciplinary. We will bring together researchers which are in the different universities, which are not only within Singapore, but outside of Singapore. So through the forum, we understand the healthcare needs, the priority needs of the Asian countries. Through the research activity, we will try to come up with solutions which would be innovative. And then we aim to give a leadership program. In this leadership program, we are going to train the policymaking officials, the industry. So these people will have a better understanding of the problems which are in the region and how to tackle them. So in this way, by focusing on three aspects like forum, research, and leadership program, which are integrated, 
and help each other to streamline we aim to achieve the outcome of uh, being able to deliver better healthcare services in asia uh, as i've already mentioned that we aim to do it through research we already have funding from the gsk edb trust fund and uh, with regard to governance we will be having a gsk edb uh, steering committee we have uh, peer review committees there will also be a neha managing committee so and nus gai will be the overarching body which will see that the uh, implementation of the program is smooth and that all the deliverables are achieved with this i would like to thank my presentation thank you i, I just wanted to add two comments uh, to that uh very nice presentation. Uh, one is that uh, the, the, the actual groups that would be doing a lot of the work, the, the, the research and the work, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, the NUS Business School and the Yong Lulin School of Medicine. So uh, in a way, what GI is doing is actually helping to coordinate uh, and to drive the different programs and to be ultimately accountable to the funder for a effective and high quality delivery of uh, the work that we do. Um, secondly, uh, you can see that uh, uh, parts of this are, are more thought leadership, like the forum and the um, uh, educational programs are, in a sense, thought leadership and network building. And uh, But what we think would be particularly interesting is the research that we pursue through this uh, grant uh, can have actually many, many uh, uh, connections back to other types of research that we might want to do uh, uh, as part of GAI. For example, either in the finance area or uh, in the uh, aging uh, uh, arena, uh, th th there are actually very strong potential intersections between health policy, health management, health service delivery, health financing, and uh, aging on the one hand, uh, and uh, as well as uh, healthcare, uh, public health and, uh, and uh, health systems. So, so these are potential areas that over time uh, we may choose to build up uh, using resources from other areas. Uh, but when uh, put together as a whole, I uh, would uh, then represent a, uh, uh, I hope, uh, a uh, comprehensive and a, a highly visible concentration of uh, work in this broad area. So, so this is how uh, we want to take in these projects and, and also uh, Put them in as uh, as pieces that eventually will add up to a much larger capability. Thank you, Professor Tan, and thank you, Etty. Um, we now move on to the first presentation of the day, mapping the technological and cultural landscape of scientific development in Asia. I would now like to call upon the project's principal investigator, Dr. Philip Cho, from the Asia Research Institute, to please introduce his project. I'd first like to thank President Tan and everyone else for coming today. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Director Sitharam and Professor Schoenwalter and the GAI, GAI for the honor of presenting today. Um, I came to Singapore just about a year ago as a postdoctoral fellow, and I've never encountered such a welcoming and vibrant academic community with so many opportunities. So I just wanted to start out on that note of thanks. Um, now, what our group is interested in is how science and technology development lay at the heart of any notion of the rise of a global Asia. Now, throughout the region, there's been a historic revival of scientific and technological research um, involving massive investment and migration of intellectual labor, reshaping how science is practiced worldwide. Now, Asian countries have already surpassed the European Union in uh, research and development expenditure, and at the current pace are likely to overtake the United States in the near future. Now, there are two different uh, trends I'd like to point out. The first is that much of this investment is concentrated in massive big science research facilities, uh, often as symbols of national pride. And the second is that the norm now is in collaborative international research uh, within uh, uh, scientific networks. Now, this is resulting in new emerging trans-regional alignments of technolog technological infrastructure, expertise, and research, sometimes driven by political agendas, such as China's extension of soft power through space technology with, along a south-south uh, axis uh, with countries like Nigeria or Brazil and Argentina, 
or sometimes these alignments are driven by um, the nature of the research itself, uh, necessitating international collaboration and high-speed integration of data across vast distances, such as with very long-range baseline interferometry, important for astrophysics and space uh, programs. Now, our objective is to map the shifting centers of big science research networks in Asia. And I think this is vitally important, especially for countries like Singapore, uh, in order to navigate between the Scylla and Charybdis of some of its larger neighbors um, in the future. And second is to assess whether these big science centers are truly transforming Asian cities into the anchors of global research networks, driving research agendas, or are they merely outsourcing posts of intellectual labor? In other words, are these... If, for those of you who remember your Western Civ, um, the Baconian New Atlantises, or Houses of Wisdom, if you want to talk about um, some of the Islamic traditions, uh, that um, are really repositories of knowledge and generation, uh, generation points of knowledge, or are they merely technological monuments to uh, sometimes political folly? Um, now, we're not just interested in cities at the macro scale, but also the micro scale of how laboratory space is used um, in scientific practice. So, for example, one research facility, if we look at the traffic flow and the connections of the researchers, may have more to do, uh, one section of research facility may have more connection with another facility a thousand miles away than they do with the offices next door. Uh, third, uh, we want to, whether these are New Atlantis's Towers of Babel or Houses of Wisdom, uh, we want to frame the historical development of Asian big science centers within their broader historical narratives about the scientific legacies in different regions, such as China, India, and the Middle East. Um, and what we find as a commonality in a lot of these regions are there's often in recent history there have been discussions that open up in these various places where Science tech technology is often used as the foil for a very thinly veiled political critique um, of the contemporary regimes. Um, fourth, we'd like to, we don't want to just have a one time deal where you hold a conference and you have scholars come over and talk about science tech technology development at a particular time and that's it. We want to develop a platform for persistent science tech technology forecasting. Uh, which will involve uh, my collaborators, uh, data mining and network visualization software to, to augment our social science and historical research. And finally, uh, as we are an, an educational institution, uh, I think it's also important that we launch um, a science and technology networking website as a means of public outreach and as, also as an educational tool. Um, if you ask the average Singaporean what goes on in Fusionopolis, it may not be the New Atlantis or the or Tower of Babel that he thinks of. He may just be thinking of the Wizard of Oz because he simply does not know what, what, what's going on inside. Um, also, as, as an educational tool for students to critically think about and write, their, write about their field, because if we graduate students from here who haven't critically thought about what is the state of their field, how did they get there, where is it going, and then to write about that clearly and effectively uh, somehow I feel like I would have failed as an educator in that sense because we're not just training technicians, we're trying to train the global leaders in science technology in the future who can think ahead and have critically thought about some of these issues. Now we're interested in, of course we're interested in commercialization products, but we're also just, we're also interested in broad perspectives on science and technology practice, um, not just uh, uh, some definitions of, of uh, or focus on uh, commercialization of products. And under some of these definitions, we might actually lose uh, sight of some important key innovators in history, such as Copernicus, because he failed to brand the heliocentric theory and really profit from it, or Newton and Leibniz uh, for not really settling the IP issues over who invented the integral calculus or fluxions. Now, there's a certain cognitive aspect to how social... Uh, how research communities are represented and how knowledge is socially reproduced. And I just kind of threw in this Jackson Pollock painting as a uh, representation of the tangled web of some of these research networks. And I'm just going to go over a range of some of these types of uh, representations. Here's the typical kind of static representation of, of, of a co-authorship network in a particular research group and how the, the labor is divided up. 
showing how, for example, mathematicians up in the, near the top uh, have very in, few interconnections and uh, are more individualistic in how they work, whereas the biologists on the bottom working on structure, the structure of RNA have many more linkages in between them. But we actually want to go beyond this to look at kind of dynamic change um, over time and geographic space. So we want to, want to be able to track an individual, for example, as he moves across a network of research, uh, research uh, centers. Uh, and at each point in time, also be able to know what his uh, associated network is at that time, or an aggregate or flow of, of, of a group of, of researchers. Um, and beyond simple uh, co-authorship or uh, collaborators, we also want to look at other factors that are important in the formation of, of different kinds of research group identities, such as model organisms, perhaps, or the kind of equipment, like the an affimatrix bioarray, or uh, the kind of research paradigms or protocols that they utilize. Um, Aside from just geographic space, we might also think of virtual spaces and how, say, the proteomic, proteomic, proteomics network interacted through uh, a number of different virtual spaces. Uh, for Professor Wang Gongwu, <laughs> if you look at historical examples, we could, for example, look at uh, the spread of sericultural technology or the, the knowledge about raising silkworms and how to produce silk in the 18th century through a net, how that spread through a network of temples to the sericulture goddess or the silkworm goddess. If you look into the history of biology and model organisms in the 1930s, uh, we can see um, how um, the uh, uh, research group form an identity uh, along as, as people who worked with a particular modern organism or, or the fly. And on the left, you'll see uh, Calvin Bridges' fly totem pole uh, as uh, uh, mapping out the mutant genes in Drosophila. Now, if space aliens came down to Earth today and wrote the natural history of the planet, they just might conclude that first, dogs ruled the Earth, uh, served by their humans, um, and that uh, mice were perhaps the most uh, successful and prolific organism on the planet, uh, uh, populating the growing niche environment of the, of the laboratory. So as a test case to build a prototype um, and uh, uh, test some of the, 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 um, the technology that we want to develop, we're looking at the uh, Pan-Asian SMP consortium that was anchored here at the Genome Institute of Singapore. And it's a manageable sort of Asian research network that we can study as, as a start um, because it involved about 93 researchers um, in uh, 40 institutions in 11 countries. Um, and this is not Ed Edison Liu on the dating game, but uh, Edison Liu as a knowledge and skill vector, where we don't want to just think of knowledge as something that's free-floating, but embodied in people who travel along as kind of a micro-research ecosystem of students, organisms, equipment, um, e and even families. Uh, so. What I'll do right now is show you what we've been working on. So this is what we've just put together after working around the clock for about three weeks. Uh, and this is just a static representation, but we're going to um, have this more kind of in the animated uh, dynamic form soon. Uh, this is the SMP network that I was just describing, where we could track, for example, an institution uh, in a, in a particular country, for example, the United States. And we'll see Affimatrix, which was the company that was very important in that particular research group. Um, or a particular institute and the individuals in it. Let me rotate. Um, alternatively, we could track, we might decide to track an individual like Edison Liu and see how his particular network of associates changed from year to year. Back out. Now skip over to 2010. So 
So for example, if we see these sorts of connections, uh, we'll see that in 2010, uh, among Edison's uh, associates, these were connected also to institutions in, in China or, or um, in, in Thailand or in other places in, in, in the world. Let's jump there, and here we have it back at Singapore and some of the other connections he, to him in 2010. So just um, some of from the, some of the preliminary data, we can see that this particular consortium uh, really did foster inter-Asian sorts of collaboration, not just for this particular project, but overall um, with Singapore very much anchoring uh, the, entire, the entire network. But if we look even more closely, um, the United, these are divided up by region, where far the far left grouping are countries in Asia, and then Europe, um, and the US, and uh, South America, and other, and other places. But that the point here is that the United States was also a clear anchor among the uh, collaborators, not just in Singapore, but in all the institutions in that, in, in that consortium. So even though this was an Asian consortium, a research consortium, um, the U.S. was very much an anchor for it as well. This is looking just for the Genome Institute of Singapore. Now, just to put this together and to crunch these numbers and to develop the network visualization took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears over the past three weeks. Um, and because we, what we did was we had to do this manually, uh, inputting about a thousand different records and looking at the uh, just the five-year histories of, of the, all the researchers in that particular consortium. And so that's why we desperately need um, some of the data mining and automated software that uh, Professor uh, Can can provide. And Min, would you like to take over from here? Okay, thanks, Philip, for uh, letting me talk a little about uh, what we're doing over in the School of Computing. So I'm going to talk about how we automate this work um, in the future, right? This is what we plan to do for the project, is to take the blood, sweat, and tears and make it less bloody, less sweaty. Okay, so there are five steps in this um, that we're planning to do. Uh, first, we're going to look at... Uh, obtaining those metadata resources about the bibliometric records, all of the scholarly articles and data that uh, the Pan-Asian SMP Institute has created. Okay, From there, we're going to actually analyze those documents. We're going to use machines to read those articles and mine bibliographic information from that. Uh, this is a, an error-driven process. Actually, there's a lot of uh, engineering involved, uh, research involved, uh, to put together all of this data in a canonical format that allows us to uh, put together demonstrations as like what you've just seen. Okay, so I'm just going to step you through this uh, to give you a taste of how difficult this is um, to do automatically. You already know how difficult it is to do uh, manually. Okay, so... Uh, for example, we might start with a metadata source like Google Scholar. Many of us in this room uh, do vanity searches. I'm certainly guilty of that, too, to check on our uh, impact um, individually or on uh, our, our colleagues to see how well we're doing. Um, this is uh, easy to do for an individual, but programmatically it's very difficult. So we have to be able to build programs to automatically traverse the links that Google Scholar provides or other metadata sources provide to uh, pull down the data. We're taking that data and saving it into an XML format so that we can uh, reuse it for other projects, including this one. Okay. Uh, a number of you may be wondering why we use Google Scholar. There are lots of other databases that are probably more comprehensive, and that includes things like the Web of Science, ISI. Um, 
The reason is, is because this information is freely available to the public, right? If we want this information to be replicatable and studied by others, it needs to be available to all institutions, not just ones that subscribe to uh, ISI or Web of Science. Okay. We know ISI doesn't also cover as many venues as Google Scholar, so that's another very important reason why we want to concentrate on this. Okay. Uh, we do want to, uh, at some point, uh, collaborate with libraries and uh, NUS libraries to enhance our system, but uh, for now we're um, looking at freely available sources. Now, if we pull information from Google Scholar, we get certain metadata information, for example, the authors of the paper, uh, titles of the paper, etc., but not all of the other information. For example, we don't know which venue it might be um, published in or uh, exactly what all the author's names because a lot of that data is truncated by Google Scholar. So especially things like the Pan-SMP network that uh, Philip painstakingly did by hand, we couldn't get automatically from Google Scholar because simply there are too many authors involved there. So some of the problems of the metadata that we capture from these open source uh, repositories is uh, what I've just talked about. Not all of the metadata is listed. We get uh, uh, incomplete information, like Google Scholar doesn't tell you which offer is associated with which institution, which is a vital part of this project. Okay. Um, some of the metadata is wrong. So, for example, sometimes um, affiliations are captured as uh, offers, right? So we have international business machines as an offer, which is incorrect, right? This is why we can't trust a single source of information as canonical. So to follow that up, the research part of this work is in understanding and reading applying machines to read PDF articles. Okay, That means when we download an article, we're going to actually uh, uh, extract the text out and mine that information from those PDF articles. We want to find out people's affiliations, uh, offers, uh, uh, email addresses, as well as uh, their full names, Okay, and uh, be able to unravel that information and uh, glue it together with the information that we're getting from open source networks. So I want to impress upon you how difficult that process is. Okay, um, When we analyze text, it's actually very easy for humans to do it. Okay, But artificial intelligence research is still not quite there to the level where we can do this scientifically well. All right, let me give you an example here. Uh, apologize for the uh, vanity search here. Here's two references to two pieces of work that I've done Okay, on the bottom part of this slide. Now, they're in completely different formats Okay, with respect to how the strings, uh, the, the citations are built. But we have to glue these together. All right? They have to be uh, associated with the canonical text. And that's one of the difficulties of putting this uh, project together. So we have to be able to clean all of those records automatically because, in fact, the Pan-SMP network involves, as Philip says, 93 very prolific offers and many, many citations to those papers. So we're talking on the order of tens of thousands of citations just for this project alone. Okay, so the final part of our project is uh, in this uh, bibliometric building process is to revise the scholarly network that we get from our scholarly papers from this open source project from Google Scholar, right? We're going to take the data that we got from these OCR documents and add them back into the network, right? We have to re revise the scholarly network to merge all of these existing fields together to provide for considerations for different formats and spelling errors. So when we're, com when we're finished, or at, during the course of this project, we'll be producing a number of in-depth case studies of global scientific and technological command centers um, in, in Asia. And we're particularly also interested in issues of technological choice and values and the humanitarian impacts of some of these. Because the, the working out the networks is just the beginning. Because it's from there that we can then dig more deeply into the history and the culture of some of these, of some of these uh, 
uh, research societies and, and, and networks. Um, and one of the uh, major uh, case studies that we'll be looking at is, uh, will be conducted by Professor Silva uh, Cool. Ben, do you want to present this part? Yeah. All right, I'll try to make this brief. Uh, I'm a, kind of like the odd person out for this project because I'm at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, so I'm not an engineer, I'm not a computer programmer, and my knowledge of philosophy and art is not nearly as deep as Phillips. But something that I do really enjoy studying is energy technology. I don't know if any of you have read some of the new projections from the International Energy Agency, but just like you see massive economic growth in Asia for the next two or three decades, uh, a majority of the world's energy demand is set to rise here. And if you believe the projections, demand in this region for energy will double uh, in the next 25 to 30 years. So take every power plant, take every pipeline, take every refinery, we'll have to build twice as much uh, if those projections remain accurate. To solve this kind of energy conundrum, right, the need to build sources of energy supply, because energy is, of course, at the backbone of all of our modern lifestyles, uh, a lot of people have started talking about bigger mega energy projects, like the Three Gorges Dam in China, uh, massive interconnected pipelines that span countries, interconnected transmission networks for electricity, big uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas facilities like the one in Bintulu, which is the third largest in the world, uh, which is in Malaysia. So I thought it would be very interesting to kind of take a look not only at the networks that form behind these types of mega projects, but also how they kind of build these values of different scientific practice into the technologies they develop. I mean, there's no single way to build a dam. There's no single way to build a pipeline. And so one of the things that I'm interested in is, is looking at whether there's actually an Asian way of doing dams or pipelines, or whether these different networks, uh, with the way that they've kind of evolved over time, exert themselves when they make technology in different ways. And so, to keep it manageable, I figured I would stick with the big stuff. So, you're talking multi-billion dollar projects that typically involve, because of their scale, both financial and geographic, more than one country. Uh, and I would utilize uh, social science methods, uh, mostly field research, research interviews, um, and uh, case study approach. Uh, and these pictures here are actually of the Namtung Dam in Laos, and there was a Ratchaburi connection pipeline, which are both set to be part of the Transasian electricity grid, uh, another very ambitious energy project. So I figured the first case study would be the TAGP, which is the Transasian Gas Pipeline Network. Uh, which I've already collected some data on from an earlier grant we got at the Lee Kuan Yew School from the Academic Research Council. Uh, and you can see to the right a visual representation of this network. It would basically connect the gas reserves in the Gulf of Thailand, the gas reserves spread across Indonesia, and the gas reserves offshore Myanmar, uh, and try to kind of create a network that would send the gas all around Southeast Asia, just like you see in Eastern Europe and the European Union. And you can see to the left that so far we're talking about uh, billions of dollars of investment for the components that have already been selected. And if it goes forward, you could see up to $100 billion of investment into the pipeline system if it actually reaches into Northeast Asia to satisfy demand centers in Japan or China uh, or other parts. The second one, uh, which I've already started doing this last few weeks, while Philip was working away on the beautiful network, I was actually in Sarawak doing research interviews for part of this project, is this thing cleverly called SCORE. It stands for the Sarawak Corridor of Renewable Energy. Uh, and it would take all of those uh, hydroelectric resources in Borneo, uh, you're talking thousands of megawatts of potential, and transform them into a network of 12 dams. Uh, the goal uh, through it, its Malaysia has these development corridors, uh, and this is one of the five. And so the goal is to actually, I think, increase the size of the economy in Sarawak by a factor of five in the next 30 years, which is very ambitious. And the backbone of this, they believe, is free, widely available energy. Uh, and since Sarawak has lots of rain, lots of rivers, they figure, why not build 12 dams? Uh, and you can see them all here, including the largest dam in Southeast Asia, which is the Bakun Dam. Uh, which is the one in red, which is 2,400 megawatts. And connect these to industrial users, aluminum smelters, possibly some refiners, uh, possibly other heavy energy intensive manufacturing, like steel or possibly semiconductors, uh, and to make kind of Borneo, or at least Sarawak, compete with Singapore, with Japan, uh, with some of the other highly industrialized countries. 
So these big energy projects are fascinating because they're kind of unique, right? The capital intensity that's involved, the number of scientists, engineers, experts, the labor is massive. For Bakun Dam, you're talking about 10,000 separate contractors, engineers, and workers at the peak of construction. For the Transazian gas pipeline network, if it were to go forward, you're talking about twice to three times as much. Um, and I think we're going to see more of these massive energy projects as we go forward in Asia, precisely because of economies of scale. The bigger the project, the more you can satisfy bigger increases in energy demand. So I think that the lessons we may learn from looking at the TAGP score and a third case study, which I still have to select, could also help inform discussions that lots of Asian policymakers are going to have in the next uh, five to ten years, as well as students that we send out into the world to hopefully make a difference when maybe they're the engineer who's helping build the dam, or they're, if they're from the Lee Kuan Yew School, maybe the politician, or the regulator who's trying to set the right political format, or the attorney who's trying to set the right uh, legal regulations. And Philip, I'll turn it over to you to finish it off. Um, so in addition to the textual um, outputs, we'd like to produce some technological outputs as well, uh, such as the data mining and visualization software that we're working on. Um, and uh, along with that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, a social network, science and technology social networking site uh, that we also have a working model of. Uh, I'm not, not going to show it to you today. Um, as kind of a public outreach and educational tool, which will include news, analysis, text, video blog, and hopefully some, some games. And uh, also, we'd like to integrate the network visualization and data mining utility that we have into, into the website itself. And I actually like to have the students at the university drive the, the, the core content of this as, as the kind of prime movers in, in this particular project. Um, and so finally, we're also essentially reclaiming a legacy here at, at NUS that I, I don't think most people are aware of. Uh, because uh, somehow quietly over the, over the years, um, NUS and Singapore has been this, a real center not just for the, uh, for the history and sociology of science uh, research with a number of the, the major players in the field, uh, ranging from Derek Gersola Price, who while he was working at Raffles College, uh, came up with some of his seminal ideas about the uh, exponential growth of, of publications while staring at his collection of the uh, Royal Society papers. Um, Ho Peng Yok, who was a leading uh, historian of East Asian science, and Nathan Sivan, who was even married in Singapore, um, who trained then nearly all the historians and sociologists of science of East Asia in the United States. Um, such as uh, Benjamin Elman over at Princeton uh, and Marta Hansen at, at, at uh, Johns Hopkins and um, myself, not to, not to mention. Um, <laughs> and we're also uh, looking to establish some new ties with other research groups that are doing similar sorts of projects, not exactly the same. Uh, for example, uh, the Army Research Consortium has launched the Social and Cognitive Networks uh, uh, group uh, centered at Rensselaer Polytechnic. Um, there, uh, I was involved with a group called Tiger um, over at the National Academies uh, a little while back. Um, and I was also at the Chinese Academy of Sciences um, just prior to coming here. Uh, so with that, we are hoping to, again, re really ground uh, NUS in this, uh, as a leader in this area of research where we, that it always has been. Um, and. Uh, really take us forward from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A fascinating presentation. Also very well timed, I might say. <laughs> Which gives us uh, ample time for discussion. And uh, I'd like now to open this uh, to the group as a whole. and. Uh, couple of things to remind uh, ourselves. One is, since we're talking across cultures and disciplines here, there is no such thing as a foolish question. So uh, please ask what is on your mind. Secondly, uh, the first time you speak, it would be helpful if you would uh, give your name and affiliation so that we uh, get to know a little more in detail uh, who's here. So with that, uh, the floor is open. 
So I'm, I'm Peter Little um, from Office of Deputy President, Research and Technology and, and the Life Sciences Institute. I was, um, I was very struck by your choice of uh, large projects. And it seems to me that it's almost self-evidently true that if you work with, if you study a large international project, you come to the conclusion it's a large international project. But what I think, I think would be extraordinarily interesting to do is to um, look more carefully. We know, we know what the cost of that project was. We know what the cost, although it's quite difficult to dig into, we know what the cost of the GIS is. We also have very similar figures for NUS. And our view is quite straightforward, is that if you actually look on a cost basis, you discover that actually NUS does an enormous amount of research. So the question is, is that research actually intrinsically different from the internationalism of the, of the big international projects? I think it's very easy to focus in, in science on the large-scale projects. There can be extremely long and probably fruitless conversations as to whether this is the way science should or shouldn't be done. Those arguments are being fought out across the world. But it really seems to me to understand how we're going to impact, Asia is going to impact on the rest of the world. We don't want to just pretend that there are a number of impactors. NUS itself, just the volume of research that we do is extraordinarily large. And I think the techniques that you have would actually be a wonderful opportunity to start collecting together the alternative ways of doing research, which is not large international collaborations. It's actually multiple small international collaborations because most of us collaborate internationally. And I would be absolutely fascinated to find out whether GIS was actually different from what this university is doing in very, very similar domains. When we do this kind of network analysis, that's just the groundwork for us then to go further and dig, dig into uh, the, the, the personal papers, the correspondences, and the, the kind of interactions among, among a lot of the researchers. So, uh, you know, it's, we're not just interested in what, what's the final product, but how are uh, research interacting, researchers interacting. If we look at, say, if we fractionate, say, at one of these large, large networks, we could we, we might see different behaviors in terms of not just disciplines, but uh, uh, regional differences in terms of how physicists uh, in, in the United States may be collaborating in different ways than uh, physicists in, in China are collaborating, uh, possibly for, for structural or you know, uh, government reasons. Um, so again, that would be uh, just the beginning. And, and in terms of the impacts as well, and the, the kind of cultural impacts, for example, of the implications of uh, looking at genetic diversity in, in Asia, how, how that will play out in the rhetoric and the kind of uh, uh, dialogue that's going on in different countries in Asia, I think will also be very important and will look very different from if we're looking at Vietnam and China or, or, or the United States. So in that case, I, I, I certainly wouldn't disagree with you, but uh, we have to start somewhere, and we're starting with the, the, the larger projects. But we'll uh, be of great, uh, most utility in terms of using some of the, the data mining, because the smaller projects we might be able to handle manually. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's in, that, in that sense, that's why we're starting with the, the, the big science projects. We have to start somewhere, and um, so that's where we decide to start. Uh, Yong Hunter from Institute of Real Estate Studies at the NUS. This is really interesting and fascinating data and methodology. Actually, in my field, uh, people like uh, doing econometric, uh, spatial econometric analysis or economic geographies would very much like to see this kind of data. So I, I propose the natural extension for the next project will involve some of the econometric modeling uh, using the sp uh, spatial technology. And uh, there are also some economic theories in uh, publishing in those uh, top journals like the AI uh, Court Legion of Economics. Those kind of models may be applied to some of the data. We can narrow down to some specific sectors uh, 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 Professor Little mentioned uh, the size of the project or the areas of the research, and then we can limit it the data size and then allow us to build up some econometric model into the analysis. Thank you. Sure, there are, there are any number of ways we could develop this project further. Um, one that I've been talking about with Kenneth Dean uh, over at uh, uh, McGill 
recently because he's already mapped, done the GIS, GIS mapping of all the different uh, ethnic and religious groups in Singapore and the transnational communities of, of, of some of these groups. And we're talking about collaborating with um, uh, Harvey Whitehouse over at Oxford because uh, he's putting together a large grant. Um, possibly. <laughs> possibly. We haven't decided on that yet. Uh, about looking at the uh, kind of disease and health factors within within these different communities and linking that to some of the, 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 the tracking software. Um, in terms of, uh, if you, you just saw the, the visualization application, I mean, the next logical step is, would obviously be to uh, look at two things, um, the kind of, a, a kind of a gesture interface or uh, even just empirical testing of what are the limits of cognitive load in terms of how complex those diagrams should be or can be and what would be the ideal way of, uh, of shaping them. So that would then involve perhaps Trevor Penny and, or Maria Kochevnikov who are in the psychology department who do a lot of that kind of uh, neurocognitive research. So that, and, you know, econometrics, there, there are just any number of ways that we could take this once we, but we have to first get the groundwork done first and develop, say, a working prototype and then we can build from there. Uh, Kang Chong from Sociology. I think your, your last comment is, I think, precisely the problem. Because in network analysis, uh, what you put in is what you get out. And because of the amount of effort you need to actually mine the data, you don't have a whole lot of uh, choices with regard to sampling of projects. So the question I have is, you know, a bit more clarity on how you select your projects. Because how you, the project you select will determine your output. And there are any number of ways to do it, mm -hmm. you know, any number of ways. And different disciplines have different dynamics. So we need to understand a bit more about sampling. Sure, well, I'm particularly interested um, in looking at projects that I think uh, from an historical or point of view have some significance. For example, China's space program, I'd really love to try to, to model that in some way. And again, these, uh, this isn't meant to be a fully automated system. It's supposed to augment our, 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 our abilities. Um, again, it's not supposed to take, every, take everything over, but uh, as a way of uh, helping us out, trying to get more data or look for linkages. If we're dealing with uh, large numbers of people, look for linkages that we might not notice just you know, by 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 um, by 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 eye. Um, so, for example, uh, for China, I'd really like to look at the the space program and how that plays out in its kind of larger rewriting of its of its historical narrative for for science and technology as kind of the new age of discovery. For example, uh, kind of reversing the the old idea of Oriental despotism and how you know the the uh, the promising voyages of Zheng He were then just Stamped down because of of, of you know the uh, of the, the uh, uh, imperial government's kind of lack of foresight, um, uh, and again we we see this kind of discussion going over over uh, happening over and over again in different places. Um, uh, if we look at the uh, uh, the kind of um, science and life debates in the early 20th century, or the kinds of um, uh, uh, you know stamping out superstitions or even uh, the, the Jang'an arsenal or even up leading up to 80, 89 you have the whole blue planet, uh, blue planet, yellow planet, uh, you know, Hushang types of dialogues going on where, where science technology is used as foil. So in our selection, we have to think of two things. One, which ones are feasible? Where can we actually get data? So for example, it might be very difficult to get science. We, have, we, have to, we are going to be doing uh, feasibility studies first. Uh, so, for example, the, for space technology, I could probably get uh, more information dealing specifically with uh, like Lamos Fast and uh, the the telescopes because I have I, I know I know people um, uh, working on those and uh, part of the national laboratories. Uh, so that would be more accessible. Uh, we might have to uh, uh, take a more indirect route in terms of some of the collaborators with with. Uh, the uh, um, launch vehicle uh, studies by going, rather than going straight to Beijing, going to Venezuela instead. So again, it's, in that sense, we're doing, it would be more just straightforward 
social science and historical research that we would have to take on um, and first see which studies are feasible to do. Um, and then uh, start with that uh, uh, as a way then to see how, how we can then uh, expand that further with some of the, some of the, some of the technology. Again, it's not a, an emphasis on depending on the technology, but trying to use it to, to help us. I mean, one of the things, my, my laboratory for many years has done an enormous amount on network analysis of, of, uh, in biology, and I think one of the things that we've come to the conclusion is that the representation of knowledge by networks is ex seductive, it's extremely attractive, but actually um, the comment you made about sensory overload comes in incredibly fast. So, I, I mean, there is an enormous wealth of expertise in NUS elsewhere that basically just takes the theory of networks and turns it into, st into statistics because really identifying, um, visualizing something is not the same as saying what you visualized is significant. It's something we learned the hard way and there is a now, I mean, a huge body of knowledge as to how you can actually start to do this intelligently and to, to, um, to, to get away from some of the problems that you've, uh, you've discussed. We'd be very happy to, to discuss collaborations. In a, I mean, it's a really remarkable collection of people and very disparate in different, different, different disparate disciplines that, uh, that have been engaged in these sorts of processes. Uh, let me just comment on Peter's comment. I think as part of the deliverables uh, to this project, we want to create a platform that will enable people to do some of these analytics. The machines uh, that we are providing in terms of the algorithms can only generate the data, but it requires a scholar to generate the narrative behind it. So this addresses the questions that have been asked earlier. Um, we need scholars to generate what story they want to tell and for the software to build the analytics to give the evidence to support that story. So it's a, a tool um, that we said in, in Philip's word will help to reduce the blood, sweat and tears. But it is a tool. It can't do everything on its own. And we have to guide it as scholars. Uh, just to follow up the previous conversation, I think that's exactly what economics, uh, some of the economics model may come in to help. Uh, because in the economic literature, there are people study, for example, the company's location, why Microsoft moved to that area, whether the spillover effect or natural advances factor. So what they do is they are not, can not only look at the geographic, physical uh, distance, but also they can look economic di distance or social distance, kind of different measures. So by using that control, it can sort out what it's sort of pushing those uh, researchers uh, uh, work together or so relocate into Singapore or Asia. So that's what I mean. The next project, maybe uh, some of the economists can work with you to figure out how to use the tool you provided, how to use the data you provided. Thank you. That, that stimulates a question of my own uh, for both of you, I guess, uh, a, a very practical one based on experience uh, about a year ago. I was involved with a group who had been asked by ASTAR to do a review of all of the Science and Engineering Research Council institutes, research institutes in Fusionopolis and, and other locations uh, here on the campus and, and at NTU and, and elsewhere. The, the question being asked of, of us was how important have these research institutes been in anchoring industries in Singapore? It's a very critically important question for the Singapore policymakers and, and Singapore taxpayers. Um, we all believe that it's been important, but the, the issue you, you get into, and I'll, I'll cite a partially true, partially fictitious example and just make some things up here. So you've got a, the Data Storage Institute, and you've got Seagate making hard drives. Seagate has a very big presence here in Singapore. Well, would they have come if there had been no Data Storage Institute? 
the people at TSI will tell you, oh no, they, they wouldn't have come. And the people at Seagate, because they like the Data Storage Institute, will say, no, no, we, we wouldn't have come. But then EDB uh, will remind you that they gave some very attractive perks to Seagate to come here, and, uh, and so on. You can begin to see how this all uh, unravels. And then the, the group uh, that I was involved in said, well, could you even say, okay, 30% uh, of it was due to data storage and 40% of it was due to EDB and so on, but that's a linear set of thinking and it's not obvious that even that is a legitimate question to answer. Uh, this is not directly related to the project you're working on, but certainly indirectly related to it, and I'd be curious to know do you people think about these things? Uh, could you have done the job that we didn't do very well for SERC <laughs> with the kinds of tools that you have? I mean, I'll just throw in a little anecdote myself. Um, uh, for example, Affimatrix, right? They, they, they come in, um, uh, they move to Singapore, uh, opening one of their uh, first, I think, plant outside the United States in Singapore. Uh, and why? And why, why does Illumina, one of their major competitors, move here too? Well, it seems as if they already had uh, because of Singapore's uh, computer industry, they already had all the, cl the, cl the kinds of facilities with clean rooms set up, so it's very easy for them to make that move. And it's, it's kind of not suspicious, but it's, it's no coincidence, I think, that they actually they provided, you know, for the SMP consortium, what were they using as their common piece of equipment, an the matrix array. Um, so I mean, there, there are any number of factors you can look at in terms of you know, why you know, clusters uh, firms will cluster in a particular region for economic or even just infrastructure regions. So um, uh, in that sense, it, it, there's no one answer. It's, it's a matter, it's a case-by-case -case analysis. Yeah, actually that, that issue partly addressed by one of the paper I mentioned, uh, there are uh, co uh, economic colleagues published a paper in Econometric, uh, uh, another in quarterly journal of economics. They looked the so-called natural advantage or spillover. Uh, for example, why Google picked that location because there's an uh, Intel next by. So there's a competition also. There's uh, their their employees have a lunch and then they has a uh, sort of intellectual uh, stimulations during the lunch, they can catch up, chat, and then they also need to worry whether the Intel will grab the employee from Google. So uh, all sorts of info, uh, those kind of issues. Uh, they build an economic model to do economic analysis. Why Bay Area is the area most of the high-tech company choose there. Uh, this sort of analysis maybe once you have a data collected, you have the tool built up and then we try to think through whether we can apply some of the economic analysis like uh, Professor Showwater uh, mentioned to analyze one step further what percentage cost uh, people relocate to Singapore or whether it's a government policy or it's a co-authorship or it's a uh, side of just people like the cleanness environment here, this kind of analysis. You can see the team there. We are a team largely of geographers, it has to be said, but coming from de very different styles of geography. And then Prof Ho is with us from sociology and Dr Chan from um, this uh, SDE. So first of all, for the outline of the presentation, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about, I'll give an overview of the project, explain how I think we think it connects with the GIA mission, and then I, we pull out specific features, approaches, and details of the project to give you a little bit more insight in detail. Um, and alongside that, we give a case study of a, a for example of Singapore. Um, we're still deciding a lot about the project. We haven't started our project yet. Um, it's budgeted to begin um, in September. Um, but it just gives you a taste of some of the elements we want to talk about um, to focus on the unique selling proposition of the project and I'll offer some uh, concluding comments. Um, and it's definitely a sort of team effort, so I'm thanking my uh, collaborators on this for their input into this particular presentation. Um, the actual presentation, of course, is my own responsibility, so if it's a disaster, that's my fault. Um, First of all, to say something about the critical engagements with urban theories and studies. So where do we situate ourselves academically and intellectually? 
Much of urban theory was never or is no longer relevant for understanding and analysing urbanisation processes in Asia. Indeed, many people are arguing that it's not just a mismatch for Asian cities, but it's a mismatch for quite a lot of the complexity that's going on in cities um, all around the world. So we want to identify the mismatch and we want to say something about that. We want to intervene in that and put the case for um, Asian processes of urbanisation, which themselves are obviously very complex, very diverse. Ours is an interdisciplinary approach, although we are largely a team with a predominance of geographers. We do, as I say, geography itself is quite an interdisciplinary um, uh, element. And so that, that's part of what we reflect. And where our approach is, uh, we're looking for a, trying to attempt a holistic analysis of social, cultural, environmental and technological interrelationships, processes and transformations and the way those elements are played out in the urban. And we're pretty inspired by Jenny Robinson's work on ordinary cities that some of you may be familiar with. And that, her uh, monograph was published in 2006. And that's certainly gaining quite a lot of momentum of debate in urban studies. Um, and one of the things we really want to do is we want to focus on ordinary people in ordinary cities. And we're going to do that through a focus on neighbourhoods. So where are these cities that we're focusing on? So the which of the four cities that we have? Um, so, we're looking at Busan in South Korea, Kunming in China, Hyderabad in India, and Singapore. And there's a sort of logic to that around the fact these could be described within the national context, perhaps, as ordinary cities. They're not the big flagship cities. Um, they're often struggling with quite intense social, economic, technological, or environmental change. Um, they might be trying to reconfigure themselves as cities, rewrite themselves. And also, um, it's important we think about Singapore, because all of us have quite a lot of expertise of working within Singapore. But Singapore is important for GAI's uh, mission statement as well. There's the sense in which, um, to what extent can Singapore learn from other Asian cities, and what can the Singapore model, um, what value can that have? for other Asian cities as they come to terms with the various changes that they're encountering. So that's the where of where we're doing it. Next is the how. So the methodological approaches we're adopting, um, we're mixing methods and the quantitative element is through surveys in a selected neighbourhood and we'll do 500 surveys per city. I mean, that's always something, as any of you do social sciences, you can claim those numbers, but whether you achieve those numbers um, can often be a, a different situation. Um, the whole part of an ethical process in social research is that people are allowed to say no, and um, lots of times people do say no and don't participate. But that's our goal. We think 500 per city should be achievable. Um, in terms of qualitative research, we're doing face-to-face -face interviews with 50 residents in each neighbourhood. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, about, bit more about the survey. But in terms of interviews for the 50 residents in each neighbourhood, they will be, obviously, they will volunteer into the research, but they will be trying to be drawn across sort of all so sorts of aspects of diversity, which is one of the elements we want to focus on. We're also um, going to conduct discourse analysis of grey and published materials by local and national governments, local planners and community groups. Because one of the things we want to look at are the ways in which people are living in the city, day by day, cheek by jowl, um, working through what it means to live in these changing contexts. But also to compare that then with the way discourse is produced about the city. So to what extent is a national government um, analysis and um, discussion of certain cities matching what's going on in, uh, uh, at the ground level? And to what extent do local governments connect with planners and community groups? And are community groups always kind of producing a discourse that's resistant to those government strategies and other planning strategies, or to what extent do they collaborate and work with them? Because we think that's important because these are all processes of how the city is defined alongside how the city is lived. And I'll give some more details on the survey later. So in terms of research questions, we have submitted uh, seven principal research questions which explore the themes of livability, sustainability and diversity. So I want to go into those in a little bit more depth. 
Um, livability I'll discuss in, in a little bit more detail uh, later on to try and draw out what we're hoping to achieve. In terms of sustainability, um, this is we're trying to broaden the notion of understanding around sustainability somewhat. So yes, it is about issues around environmental um, sustainability and infrastructure um, issues around sustainability. And they can be both environmental, in, 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 those environmental and infrastructure elements of a city or a neighbourhood within a city can be inadequate. But of course there are going to be examples where things are very adequate. They function well, um, people are satisfied with them, they're appropriate priced, accessible and so forth. So for example of that we could talk about Singapore's um, public transport system. People who use the transport system regularly always have complaints of course about infrequency of buses or crowding but nevertheless if we compare Singapore's transport system as a technological and infrastructure development um, we might find it to be um, a very good example of how to in introduce positive and sustainable um, systems of transportation. So it's not just about inadequacies, it's about finding adequacies, because what we don't want to do in this project is just critique and talk about the negatives of what's happening, but actually look for best practice of what's taking place. We're very interested, because this is sort of bottom up in the sense of looking at a very grounded perspective of the ways in which people themselves adapt and cope with what might be inadequacies, what might be lacks and um, difficulties in particular changes. So what are people doing themselves in terms of technological innovation, which sometimes might be illegal, if anybody has ever seen some cities where people illegally tap into the electricity system, it's certainly an adaptation and a coping strategy, but not terribly good for the um, electricity companies. But those coping strategies are going to be important because what we know about urbanisation processes is it's generally um, making life more difficult for people dwelling in cities who are living at the ordinary everyday level. Um, and so how people cope with those, what kind of elements they devise. Um, and certainly when that's community based, that can be very important for spreading the news about effective coping strategies and also um, feeding back up. And that's one of the things we want to try and capture is to what extent do people's coping strategies and adaptations on the ground, do they ever get to engage with policy and uh, planning? And the third element of, in, of sustainability is what um, can be called social continuity within neighbourhoods. So we're interested to find out when there's um, processes of rapid urbanisation, then often you get intense social instability. So what kind of continuity is in place? Does it mean that certain urbanisation processes in neighbourhoods forces the younger generation out of those neighbourhoods that in order to find work or to find work that they can physically get to on a daily basis, that they are forced to leave their neighbourhoods? What happens then to ageing parents? What happens to younger children? Um, so that's an important part, we think, of the process of sustainability. It's the sustainability of specific neighbourhoods in cities. In terms of diversity, we mean this very much as a focus on all sorts of social heterogeneities. Um, effectively, the ones we expect to emphasise are those based on ethnicity, age, but importantly on residential status. And what we mean by there are what we've termed old and new populations. So we're not talking about ageing in this context. That's covered under the notion of age as one of the diversity elements. But the residential status is around old and new populations of those who are established in neighbourhoods, have continuity with the neighbourhood, versus migrants, or um, they can be rural migrants, they can be people who are gentrifying an area, they might be migrants from outside over in other nations, and of course they can be refugees in some contexts. So what sort of diversity is going on, and how can we explore this, and effectively, what does it mean as part of how people live in the city in these particular neighbourhoods? And we can summarise those seven, the seven questions we've got into four key themes, and some of you may have seen this um, from the poster. So it's about people and change, about social diversity and spaces of encounter, environmental inadequacies, and urban technologies. Um, and although they're numbered one to four, um, we chose to sort of put them, cluster them in this particular square because it's really important to indicate that these things are constantly interchanging with each other. So an urban technology could bring in the change that then has a specific effect on people. That urban technology in one place could mean such changes for some other neighbourhoods that people experience environmental inadequacies. When 
populations and communities are under stress because of, say, something like environmental inadequacies, then the ways in which they deal with diversity in their neighbourhoods, particularly if some of those are newcomers to the area, um, those can, that can become either tension-filled or it can, um, can develop in more harmonious ways. And the spaces of encounter are important because this is where it all gets played out. Um, and I'll give some more examples of that later. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the ways in which we link um, and advance the GIA mission, in our call for response, the, our response to the call for proposals, we focused on two specific aspects, which were listed in the call for pro proposals as 7B and 7C. So one of those was what might be the future of urban societies and city provision in Asia? What might be the future? urban societies and city provision in Asia. And we feel very much that we connect with this because we are looking at societies in situ, but also because we have this notion of social change, spaces of encounter, different generations as part of the heterogeneity. It's very much bound up with what will be the future of these neighbourhoods. And the city provision, we're covering that through looking at infrastructure and environmental conditions, but also we're looking at governance structures, so the ways in which the city maps itself in terms of how it provides what it provides. What kinds of management of resources are required for livable cities? And we've inserted into their social and environmental, and that's because we have a very specific focus on bringing those two things together. Um, the social and the environmental are often dealt with very effectively in urban studies, but not always together and how they speak to each other. So that's one of the key areas of our response. So we will provide an overview and in-depth empirical data to contribute answers to both these questions. And I also like, as a geographer, um, the strap line on the website, Transcends Boundaries of Geography and Knowledge. Um, <clears throat> And I'd say quite clearly we do that. We're transcending, certainly transcending boundaries and be flying, flying the skies over Asia. Um, four cities in four Asian countries. And without doubt, there will be new knowledge production. Um, not least because we're talking to people who often, in studies of this nature and this scale, are not consulted. So just the knowledges produced from these neighbourhoods and collective groupings means that new knowledges will be produced. So, as promised, um, I going to I'm going to focus on selected as aspects of the project in a little uh, more detail. So, I'm going to say something about livability, and that specifically focuses on the problems with existing indices and what we're attempting to do. So, we're literally trying to t tip livability indices upside down and shake them around a little bit and ask questions of them. The outline of the survey is more of a sort of straightforward um, indication of what we're planning to do and it's some outline ideas of what we're going to develop for the neighbourhood st study. And it's important to say that there will be place specific sections in the survey. So the survey isn't just constructed in Singapore and then carried out to these different cities. We're actually engaging with local um, uh, sort of people connected either academically or in terms of their own research or at policy level in the neighbourhoods and they will actually contribute to formation of some sections of the survey. So in terms of livability and the ideal city, um, and I have to say the notion of livability and these particular um, quote, uh, sort of quota and hierarchies are not my expertise, so I would know who to field that to in my team if there are questions. But the ideal city, uh, it's neither functional nor can it be a, a unidimensional concept. And so this notion of the ideal city, of course, demands all sorts of measures and parameters to, to try and measure it. And if anybody's seen, I'm going to show you two examples of livability indices in a moment. You'll see that, you know, according to which indice, indices are used, then um, uh, the counting gets uh, placed differently and different cities move up and down the hierarchy or don't even enter the hierarchy at all. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick uh, insight into the two most recent from the Mercer's Quality of Living Survey and the Economist's Intelligent, Intelligent Units, World's Most Livable City. They need to get a more catchy title for their indices. 
Um, but then, of course, there are other ways of ranking cities. So the creative city debates is one that goes further to look at cultural and sexual diversities of cities. And cities um, and city planners, city sellers, I suppose we could call them, as those at the governance level, certainly you know, make decisions about how they're going to market their city and aspects of its livability. So this is Mercer's Quality of Living Index for 2010. Um, you see Switzerland does exceptionally well without even having that many cities. Um, it appears three times. Uh, New Zealand, Auckland is up there fourth, which is worth noting because I pull Auckland out as a particular example later on. Uh, not a single Asian city uh, is in the top ten for appearing livable. Um, so that's an interesting thing we can talk about. And Germany, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt and Munich are nicely clustered together. Um, obviously, from my accent, you probably can tell I'm from the UK, and no UK cities are in this indices either, nor in the next one. Um, so this is the other one, and there you can see Vancouver's shot to the top that wasn't even uh, mentioned previously. In fact, Canada, it looks a bit like Switzerland in this context. Australia's clustered a little bit like Germany. Um, but what I think is important to ask the questions around, for example, if we take Toronto, Canada, if you're someone of a First Nations heritage who lives in Canada, um, the native peoples of Canada, Toronto is unlikely to be the fourth world's livable city. You're likely to face high levels of unemployment, um, ex extreme uh, notions of poverty. You're much more likely to be in the worst categories for health, access to education, and so forth. Um, the same in Auckland. If we divide Auckland into categories, then just from my own research with young people and looking at, at Auckland in terms of social provision, South Auckland struggles. Um, there's lots of problems of uh, poor quality housing. The um, uh, Poverty Child Action Group there are very concerned about the health impacts of poor quality housing in South Auckland. Schools are poor, more poorly resourced and issues around employment are very problematic for young people who have a South Auckland address. So it depends who we ask these questions of in terms of where cities might be ranked in terms of livability. So, bravely, we think we can, we're going to uh, try and develop a new livability index of a kind. Um, the key feature, then, is to attempt a, diver, a, a, a different kind of livability index, which is much more based on residential neighbourhoods that are experiencing rapid and or dramatic social, environmental or sustainable changes. And that's because for the majority of people in Asian cities, that's happening. Um, these rapid changes are taking place, and they're often without consultation, they're often without forewarning, and certainly there are minimal to no compensation packages available for people who move out um, or are moved out. So it's important to find out what's going on there, and what qualities would people in such neighbourhoods say would be livable? What do they want in order to be able to leave, live uh, relatively stress-free, health, healthily, good access to education, a sense of future for their children, um, a sense of well-being and safety and security in their neighbourhoods, that even though these changes are happening, would still be some, in some degree guaranteed. And my own work um, historically in terms of um, development issues is that people often know what they want to make their lives better, and that's what we're trying to capture, and then to transfer this in some way to a little bit of this. And we think it's very important as well to focus on ordinary citizens, i.e. those who have rights within the city, but also denizens in the city, those who reside in the city but don't necessarily have the rights uh, basis to what the city can offer, um, electoral processes and so forth. So we're interested in the messiness, riskiness, struggle and adaptability of ordinary rather than elite urban residents. And if you think about who the livability indexes often comment on and what they comment on, it's often a much more elite orientated approach. So to say something about uh, methodology, uh, the survey, 500 respondents, as I said, as I said in each neighbourhood in the four cities, will adopt a clustering sampling strategy by block or street and then select households. So that provides a systematic coverage. And there will be quota sampling by ethnicity, if that's appropriate, um, age as well, um, looking at households, children, young people. Um, and the ethnicity quota allows for diversity and spaces of encounter exploration. So what's going on with different ethnic, ethnic groups? And of course, within ethnicity, we could include a, a diversity based around religion as well 
and language. Um, age gives insight into some aspects of the social sustainability that we're talking about, this continuity of communities. But also age is part of the heterogeneity, so it's part of the um, diversity element. Um, one of the problems we've got that is a challenge that we're hoping to meet is, the, uh, is getting the trans questionnaires translated into the local languages, and this will happen to, for interviews as well. And um, uh, some of the cities have more than one language present, so that's got to be determined um, from on the base knowledge that we develop. The city-based field coordinators will add in context-specific questions so that there are things that really mean something in the context of Busan or really mean something in the context of Hyderabad. Um, the face-to-face -face survey will be on site and will be delivered face-to-face -face because you've got to deal with issues around literacy, um, anxiety around form filling and so forth. And the survey, we estimate, will take 20 to 30 minutes to complete. That's an estimate, but of course, when you pilot these things, that can change. Um, so the survey will initially get respondent biodata, so we can data input that material. The livability will respond, as I said, about perceptions of neighbourhood, and that will be um, a complex set of, of working it out in terms of what does neighbourhood mean, what are people's perceptions, how do they adapt to those things. The sustainability will be around what we've called for shorthand green and non-green practices, um, whether they have access to adequate water supply, how they dispose of, of dirty water, rubbish and so on and so forth. Then social sustainability, it's around working through whether families feel they can remain in the same neighbourhoods, whether they want to um, and whether they um, want to leave. Diversity. It's about this notion of neighbouring practices. So how do people live with difference? How do they uh, live and connect? Do they connect? Do they just push past each other? Is it harmonious? Is it full of tension? And it allows us to really identify the spaces of encounter. So what are the places? What are the meeting points for the cross-diversity? So if we look at case study of Singapore, uh, as a quick thing, because we sort of were trying to work out elements of what we already knew, then um, city is an amenity-rich city, um, a high foreign population, good environmental controls, um, or, although living opposite Jurong Island, I have to question that notion of good environmental controls every time it rains and oil lands all over my apartment. But um, there is this sense of there's a process, there are checks and balances in theory, um, and we, environmental controls is also based through good adequate infrastructure systems. Um, so we're looking potentially at Marine Parade. Um, Marine Parade, there's various reasons. One, it's an older state, so you get this kind of social mix of residents by social class, ethnicity, and also longevity of being there, so this old and new population elements. Um, and there's an element of strong government support, because apparently a former prime minister um, lived there. So um, you know, it's a rather unique situation in Singapore where if you have um, people in the hierarchy of government, you're a privileged neighbourhood. Um, I don't think it happens in the UK quite the same, but I don't think Sheffield feels happy about its current co-prime co minister. Um, then also it's close to school, so it has this notion of community-based services, um, which is going to be important about one of the livability indices. It's always cropped up is access to adequate and uh, good education. Um, the commercial element um, of Parkway Parade is that it's not, uh, it's not manufacturing, it's actually commercial services, which of course many cities are moving more and more towards, and that's the changing nature of the global economy. A marine parade has a wealth of possible spaces of encounter. It has a market, a library, a uh, shopping mall, and so forth. And what's interesting about it, and it might be a positive factor in its selection, it might be something that we decide is problematic, um, but it's the weekend transient traffic. So there's a notion of people passing through this particular neighbourhood, and at certain times... Um, in certain parts of the week and through the year, that means the neighbourhood to some extent might change. And that could be a way of identifying what people think about um, the particular neighbourhood and its continuity and also the fact that the infrastructure, whether it's adequate or not. So our unique selling properties, we would identify that we have four of them. Um, the livability index will be a new way of analysing Asian urban living. 
be expected to be transferable to other city neighbourhoods and to contribute to social justice debates and practices. So if you're working with people at a grassroots level and people are struggling through those particular situations of where they live, there's inevitably going to be some jo social justice questions. And what we'd like to be able to do is to pull out what are some of the key social justice issues. Because often planners, um, policy makers, people at higher levels of government may think they know what the social justice issues are but actually they're not the things that matter most to people um, on the ground. So we want to try and sort of tease out those debates and practices and to see whether it's transferable to other cities. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier, specifically weaving together the social and the environmental issues of urban living under transformation. So we're going to weave those together, analyse how they function, see whether it's possible to really analyse both those things and to what extent do they interplay with each other. We have a comparative approach using uh, mixed methods in three relatively understudied Asian cities. We, have, we had a debate about this, about whether it's four or three, and we decided actually that Singapore is pretty well studied. There's a lot of material on Singapore. There's quite a lot of data. Um, and so these other cities, Hyderabad, Busan, and Kunming, uh, remain relatively understudied. And by focusing on ordinary cities, we're expanding the substance of this concept. So at the moment, ordinary cities, to a large extent, has been a theoretical approach thrown out. Jenny Robinson's work has focused on cities in uh, South Africa. But we want to really take the concept of ordinary cities and look at it in situ and see what's happening. And it's also about complementing, complementing but also countering dominant urban discourses of the global city and urban modernity. So we're looking forward to very interesting meetings meetings with um, the global city folk, um, largely based in sociology, um, Misha's uh, project, because there's a lot that those urban modernity and global city discourses really miss out in terms of everyday urban living. So just very quickly, three concluding comments. It's an experiment in social sciences because we can't predict our answers and, and this is why it takes us time to go through the IRB and so on and so forth. But what we know will be produced, whatever happens with this project, there's definitely going to be very interesting new knowledge and understandings of everyday living in Asian cities will be produced. And that's not to say that those studies don't exist, but um, we think by pulling the social and the environmental together, and particularly under the auspices of a certain framework provided by the Global Asia Institute, that we can say something quite interesting and unique. We do have a commitment. If you're going to talk about social um, justice issues, then there's, a way, there's always a way in which you have to think about how can our research do something in terms of social justice? Can we translate the work to make it valuable for policymakers and community actors? Uh, when we're talking about in-place situ um, questions added in, one of the things we're hoping to do is, in, um, if it's possible, if there's community action groups in neighbourhoods, is to find out what data do they need, what do they need to know, and could we integrate that in our um, survey so that we can provide data that could be valuable for them in particular ways. Um, the important thing is obviously translation from an academic context into a more accessible policy-based context. And at the same time, we're academics, we're not policy makers, and so we feel we can make very strong scholarly interventions in existing, into existing urban theory and studies. I've argued right at the beginning that Asia is often neglected, or where Asian cities are included, they're invariably compared to uh, Western or Anglo-American cities. And we feel it's important that alongside the clusters uh, research unit, I think it's urbanizations, and the faculties research unit um, called cities, um, part of uh, our linkage is with that sort of progress and project of making sure there's an understanding of an, uh, an urbanization theory that makes sense in an Asian context. Next. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the presentation. That was great. Uh, Eric Finkelstein from Duke NUS. Uh, a couple comments for you to think about. One is just a, a more formal statement uh, about the livability index. It sounds like what, what you were suggesting was that the variance of the responses should be incorporated into the index to take into account the fact that certain subgroups within a given region might actually be sort of on the short end of, of a nice city because of where they live or what they're exposed to. So it, it seems like, you know, high mean is not sufficient. You might also want to take into account 
low variance as a way to improve that or, or incorporate that into the index. Um, another point, and this may may not be accurate, but in looking at the the other ind indices that you presented, it struck me that a lot of the places that scored well were from high tax or socialist parts of the world, and it just made me think that people, you know, if getting a better city were free, people would certainly want to have more, you know, resources and better transportation and other factors. But, in fact, all of these things come at a, at a cost or a tax. And so you, you may want to try to think about or maybe you could, could incorporate willingness to pay or some other measure where, you know, whether or not people would be willing to sacrifice their own money through taxes in order to improve infrastructure in their communities. Uh, and that brings me to, to another point, not unrelated, is that you, you, you certainly mentioned the, the, the social and environmental aspects of cities, but you didn't really speak to the health issues. And, and I appreciate your point about all of these factors are interrelated, but I would argue that health is, is also interrelated, and clearly cities will impact behavior and physical activity and, and transportation and other factors. And so you may want to think about uh, how to incorporate health into this index if we believe that these cities are actually influencing health. Now, individual respondents might not make that connection, but it may be possible for you to incorporate that. And then a, 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 a final methodological point. As people go through these surveys, there are differences among populations that might res – they, their response to the surveys may – may be different just through cultural or, or other factors. And so there are these models that a colleague of ours at Duke NUS has worked on, uh, these HOPE IT models, which try to control for, for differential responses by giving people sort of a, a baseline example, and then you look at how they respond to that example, and then you calibrate your responses to the local community. And it may be – we've seen it applied to pain and, you know, other measures, but it's possible – it seems like this might be a place where you could do that same type of application. So, something to think about. Right. Thanks. They're very um, valuable commentaries. Yes. I mean, I think, um, just coming back to the thing about health, we had got, we have talked about well-being as well as part of the livability index, and I think that sort of slipped out. Um, and largely we're going on our expertise with um, with what we're doing, but I, th I think you're right that health in terms of um, really thinking about well-being, but also health can often be a point of uh, a space of encounter as well, depending on, you know, which workers are working, which healthcare system, and um, can often be things that get changed quite dramatically. Um, but particularly health provision can be something that um, is burdened with changes in Chronic conditions may be, may be covered, but if you think about acute injuries and road traffic accidents, I mean, those seem like they would be very easy to Thank you. Thank you. Just briefly. Uh, Gavin Jones from the Research Institute and <coughs> Sociology Department. Uh, yes, I, I, I like this uh, idea of the index for actual uh, cities. So, just thinking about why is it that Zurich and so on get on top of these other ones. <coughs> I was in Jakarta the last few days and I think people there, if you could get a bowl of noodles at the street side, they would say it's not a very livable city. Uh, but that criterion doesn't really go into the, into the you know, choice of the livability index and the up here and so on at the top. But just a couple of other, one, one slightly Italian check uh, point is that I wouldn't have thought uh, Busan, or at least its plans, would see it as an ordinary city. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's something you might want to comment on. I, I think I see it as a very short very dynamic um, On the survey, uh, you did describe the, you know, the methodology of, um, of selection within the uh, neighborhoods sample, but the key thing is, uh, as I understand it, you are choosing one neighborhood in each city. And so the choice of that neighborhood is going to be very crucial. Um, and it's hard to think of any city where one neighborhood really, you know, is going to represent the, the sorts of issues that we're talking about fully. Um, but, you know, with, with a good choice, uh, it, it probably is possible to get a, you know, a fair, fair 
the same subsection, but it does seem to be uh, a real issue as to which it's going to be uh, chosen. But just one other comment. Um, you mentioned the grey material, you know, that you'd be looking at um, uh, planning, planning documents that could be looking at the end of the reports and this and that. I was just thinking again in relation to, you know, Carter, Newspapers could be another thing to, to uh, keep an eye on. Uh, you know, if you look at the range of newspapers in, in, in the city, like uh, to have, ranging from, say, uh, Compass, which is the one that uh, the planners and the intellectuals and, you know, the upper class uh, read, it's a very philosophical sort of um, uh, newspaper, and a lot of the articles are, are quite academic in tone. They deal with, you know, issues of development. The deal with issues of livability and so on, but from this very, very sort of academic perspective, and then go across many other newspapers to the other end, which is Oscotta, which is the one that the uh, working class uh, read, and it's full of murders and, and rapes and natural disasters and this and that, but told in a very interesting way and from the perspective of you know of, of the people who experience these things. So. I thought again, sometimes these get quite an interesting perspective on the, um, you know, the <laughs> um, Thanks for coming. I'll just respond to the newspapers and then I'll ask Francis to say something about Busan and I'll ask. Um, Prof. Ho to say something about the neighbourhood selection, if that's okay. Um, yes, I, I think the newspapers are a really good choice, and in a project I'm doing at the moment, part of the discourse analysis around young people um, is very interesting in Singapore and Auckland in terms of, you know, the kind of blame context and, and denigration of young people. Um, and young people seem to get reported in, in the New Zealand Herald in terms of car accidents, drug-related incidents, and arrests. Um, in Singapore, it's interesting because the commentary is much more praise-giving, so it's about high achievement, and that's quite interesting then of how young people may or may not perceive themselves. So I, I think that's a great um, example to try and do as part of the discourse analysis. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the comment on Busan, Gavin. Um, I, um, I I mean, in a sense, I guess I'd have two responses to it. Um, firstly, that, I mean, taking an ordinary city's approach um, effectively says that we are, we are looking at different kinds of cities in the first instance. So, I mean, I think if we, we were to put uh, Kunming and Hyderabad next to each other, we would also say that um, there, are, there are ways to say those are actually not comparable cities if we were taking a, a classic urban theory approach. But I guess taking an ordinary city's approach is, is one that says, hey, let, let's take these different kinds of cities as a starting point and then compare them to each other. It's not to say that using the term ordinary is not to say that they're, um, they're not exceptional, but rather to say that we work from the ground up to understand what the, what the contemporary experience of those cities are. Um, but I guess the other point I would make would be about Busan specifically that does give it some connections to um, at least two other of the cities, and that is that um, Busan has gone through, uh, in the last 20 years, periods of industrial decline, uh, reducing numbers of employment in light industries, which has been a, a big area for that city in the past. Um, it's also got uh, net migration loss um, internally, so, so migrants leaving Busan and the, and the region um, into Seoul, typically, and as a result, an aging population. Um, these things combined with Busan's always secondary position uh, with reference to, uh, in comparison to Seoul in the Korean context means that it's actually a really interesting place to look at in terms of a city and indeed planners who have uh, significant aspirations for the city and where it might be in the future but have to struggle with uh, the challenges of, uh, of what's gone on the last 20 or 30 years there. You know, I'll be honest here, Gavin, and say that uh, this project has issues with sampling. Uh, I'm not going to say that we will pick the typical neighborhood because there's no such thing as a typical neighborhood. Uh, it's not unlike the, the, the question I raised to you. I mean, it's, it's like we're entering into a dark room and we're shining a torch. And the question is, where do you shine the torch? You know? uh, what we want to say then is that you know, when we select neighborhoods, we're, we're thinking of the concepts that we have there, livability, sustainability, diversity, and spaces of encounter. So rather than a statistical sampling approach, uh, because of logistics, again, we're studying four cities. So the, 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 the data collection uh, uh, issues are, are huge. Uh, we actually will select neighborhoods that allow us to get some traction on these concepts that we have up there.
I am Sanjay Patnaik from NUS GAI. Uh, you mentioned that you are going to construct a new uh, livability index. So my question is like, uh, how are you going to uh, do that? And how robust is that uh, particular index uh, in terms of uh, acceptability uh, compared to the existing ones? Thank you. Um, well, the, I'm Harvey, one of the project uh, member. Um, what we are doing is, is not going to be very radical in the sense that we are not constructing an entirely um, completely new index with no linkages with existing index. Because even though there are a variety of indexes around, um, they do have commonalities. I mean, there are certain things that all indexes measure. So, so in that sense, some part of it will be relatively straightforward, but there will be others, and these others is what we are most interested in, which we feel that we will get these other factors or these other parameters from talking to the people from the ground. So, so those are the things that we are fairly interested in. I mean, Professor Jones mentioned an example of his Jakarta trip where, you know, people talked about or if I cannot get noodles in, 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 in the streets at any time of the day, that's not quite a good neighborhood to, to be living in. So it's that kind of ideas that we are interested in, where, it, in fact, a lot of times if we were to ask a resident in, in some good ranking city, the ideas of what makes the city livable might be completely different from what gives the city a high ranking in the first place. So it's that, those kind of contradictions between lived experiences and established index that we are interested in and we are trying to intervene to, to as much extent as we can. I don't know whether that answers your question. In your presentation you use the word ordinary a great deal, ordinary people, and I think you also used it as uh, everyday, everyday citizens, I think was the other phrase. It would seem to me that uh, the dichotomy between being ordinary and non-ordinary will absolutely dramatically change where, where a city ceases or becomes livable. Um, clearly, if you go to the extreme wealth, then the game changes again. So I'm very, very interested in, in how you're actually going to try and select people for this criteria ordinary. You have to, I think, have a far more sharply articulated definition of this, because if you don't have that, you'll simply never be able to map back your, your livability index into, into the, in a sense, the real world, which is the whole of in our city Singapore's case. The other thing I would like to point out is that actually ordinariness, I mean, you only have to listen to a taxi driver discussing what they used to do before they were forced to become a taxi driver to realize that ordinariness is also confounded by age. And that seems to me to be something that's going to take you, particularly when you move into the very different demographies of the four cities. I think you're going to have some very interesting and very difficult problems of comparison in your sample sets for that reason. I don't think you need to worry about the second comment. I think it's the first one, which is the more profound. What's ordinary mean? I'll try, and then if I, um, my colleagues can chip in if they need to add something to it. Um, I think it's a really in interesting and very pertinent point. Um, I think it's something that we will be thrashing out as we start the project. Um, and um, it, it is a problematic term. It's a bit like, you know, community. You know, it's a very contested term. And what does community mean to some people um, it is obviously not community to other people. I guess it was a sort of, it was a play on the notion of, of uh, Robinson's theorization of ordinary cities. Um, and she has a much clearer definition around, I mean, as Francis said, actually, the ways in which cities are compared, um, not, you know, it's not an obsession with higher, putting cities into hierarchies. Um, and so I think, I mean, because I know people who are in wealthy situations and live in, you know, wonderful uh, gated communities with every um, provision they can possibly ask for in security would probably say them, see themselves as very ordinary. Um, so I think we probably have to definitely rethink the term, think what we mean, and, and identify particular groupings. I mean, my view is, in terms of neighborhoods, is um, that it, it's people who wouldn't I don't know, I don't know. I get very, 
you can say it's about lower socioeconomic status, but I think it's about people who um, live the city in a way that actually isn't an easy way of living the city. So there's not that much comfort, there is probably not so much reliability, um, they're struggling in terms of issues around security. Uh, so I, I suppose it's people who are... Um, Maybe historically in their older neighbourhoods may have been much more settled, as you say, taxi drivers previously and then become taxi drivers, um, facing change. Um, but I think possibly what we, we're going to try and have to work through, particularly with local collaborators in terms of identifying neighbourhoods, is neighbourhoods that have gone through change relatively recently such that there is that rupture, such that where people might have felt their lives were pretty livable um, and they could cope with the... Um, sort of problems of living in the city but we're doing okay, then something's thrown into the mix that, that shifts that. Um, and that probably will be not necessary. I mean, I think we may not talk about ordinary people anymore. And, you know, when we've defined that, it'll be, there'll be different languages that emerge that um, will be based on the empirical um, process. So um, I think it's a really important point. We are looking to try and define who do we mean, what kind of neighbourhoods, um, and that's all part of the process of the early stages of the research when we start. But thank you. I don't know whether anybody else wants to add anything. Uh, can I just clarify on, on that? Because I think the term ordinary, we use it to cities. We don't actually refer to the people because there's a, there's a history behind this idea and that is in urban studies the focus on global cities and, and competition between cities. And so Jenny Robinson's idea is what about the cities that are off the map, that, that they are ignored? And so when we use the term ordinary city, we actually refer to uh, you know, the type of city rather than the people. Um, I'd just like to, Angelique Chan from Department of Sociology and Duke NUS, I'd just like to follow up on Peter's point about um, the older population and, and ask whether you plan to focus on, um, you mentioned public spaces and where people meet, but what about the unseen ordinary people who can't get out of their homes to enjoy um, the public spaces? Is the project going to make any attempt at reaching disabled older people, for example, in these urban environments where they don't feel comfortable moving around? Uh, yes, um, I, I would work on that. I, I think we would work on that very hard to make sure that, that groups who are, uh, for a range of reasons, are invisible, um, often because of mobility issues, then they should be part of that. Um, because I think one of the, the things I envisage, particularly in the interviews, so I mean, we talked about the surveys, but we must remember there are these follow-through interviews um, where we can be much more... Um, sort of selective in what we're talking about because from the interviews we won't be looking to generalize and create um, specific comparisons but um, those people will be very important particularly the elderly because they will have been able to discuss um, and, and witness change in a neighborhood and the ways in which they identify what's changed for them and shifted their life can be very important and in terms of the notion of um, community sustainability in this um, concept of social continuity, then the elderly are going to be an important part of that because of the fact they may well have lost that social continuity. Their young, young, you know, younger members of their family who they might have expected to be able to support them could, for various reasons, have been forced out of that area for economic reasons or mobility issues. And so they will have a lot to say, and my aim is to try and reach people who wouldn't necessarily be in those spaces of encounter. Yeah, thanks. Well, I'm honored to be raising the final point. Uh, my name is Bhanu Ji Rao at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, I think the team ought to be congratulated for doing something totally different. Number one, it's, as uh, Kong Chung said, it is about cities other than the capital cities, the global cities, uh, comparing a, no, a non-global city in India, in China, Korea, and Singapore. It's, I think that's a plus. It's something which is really worthwhile by itself, which also means that hundreds of questions will be raised uh, halfway through when it is completed, 
because it's a very tough job. How do you compare cities? I, I don't think of, I can't think of any theory which says this is the theoretical framework for comparing cities. So, hearty congratulations. I think this is just a beginning. There's a lot more that will be done in this area, and you may be the pioneers. Uh, having said that, there is, will be endless questions on the questionnaire and on the neighborhood selected. I, 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 let, me, let me tell you, I lived and I am living, I lived, I am living, have been living in two of the four cities, Singapore, Hyderabad. Not one year or two years, I think before many of you have ever stepped on either Hyderabad or Singapore, I have been here. Now, to me, one of the critical issues you will face if you have selected one neighborhood only in Hyderabad, one only in Singapore. Uh, people of my um, biases, stemming from economics and statistics, people with my biases will question you, what, what's the rationale for choosing this neighborhood? So at least we must be ready with the question, that's one. Alternatively, there is a very clear perceptional difference when you say, where do you live in Singapore? Bokitima. Oh, there is something which immediately we get into my mind. And unlike Topayo. Okay? Now, if I'm, if I'm troubling you, forgive me. But in Hyderabad, we always say, I routinely say, there is a Hyderabad away from Banjara Hills. Banjara Hills is supposed to be the movie stars, the black marketeers, the millionaires, the black money holders, whatever. Now, I, I, I'm not an expert in your subject, but maybe we will all be more comfortable if you had your 500 put into the perceived great corner of the city versus the perceived so-so corner of the city. I, I, my language is not good, so forgive me for that. But I don't want to say middle class, low income class, etc. But I do want to say that there are so-called great neighborhoods, sought after neighborhoods, and there are so-called middle, middle level neighborhoods and extremely poor neighborhoods. In places like Hyderabad, it's very easy to see. Seen to be poor neighborhoods very easily. Uh, plenty of slums around. So, my request to you is consider among your group, don't take it, but consider among your group the possibility of having at least two starkly different neighborhoods considered. Okay? Perceptions may be very different. Intra country as well as across countries. Finally, you know, we who do statistical surveys. We are very conscious of the limitations even when we seek quantitative information like income, expenditure. Now, obviously you are not looking for height, weight, income, expenditure, but you are looking at perceptions, how livable and how good. So you may have to pay a little more attention on defining and building, bridging the gap between the interviewer and the interviewee. You may ask me a question, I don't understand it exactly as you think I should understand. My, my, I, I'm sorry if I have bothered you, but kindly pay attention to these before the full-scale launching of the project. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. They are really valuable comments. And um, we, we sort of, you know, just in the process of writing and getting ready for the different stages of the project, yet we have thought and agonized over lots of these things. I think in terms of um, the gap between interviewer and inter interviewee, we thought carefully about that. I mean, many of us are very skilled uh, researchers, and that's partly why interviews are in there, because that's our area of expertise, and have indeed worked across cultural differences and um, published on those very debates. Um, so we're aware of those things, but, and it's partly why we've put into the budget claims for funding to support local um, researchers who will work with us. Um, that's why there's a budget in there for interpretation, translation, and I know those things don't answer 
all the problems, but they are a step forward to actually trying to bridge that di distinction and to work around it. And there is quite a strong discourse around social science research of the value of difference across an interview context as well. Sometimes being from outside a particular community, people will take more time to explain their situation more than if somebody's from the inside the community where they presume they already know. And so often working cross-culturally in different ways, you can gather information that somebody who, who bridges that gap in every way um, doesn't necessarily gather. Um, the possibility of two different neighbourhoods, yes, we've agonised over this, and it probably will be uh, grant number two. So if this works well in the neighbourhoods we want to work in now, we may well be coming back to GAI and saying, OK, now we'd like to do different kinds of neighbourhoods, and we've got the strengths of this uh, data set so we can compare that. So I'm really pleased you raised that possibility. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can't help passing this on as, as something that I think is an example of what Professor Rao hopes will not happen. Uh, a few weeks ago I was waiting for a, a medical appointment in, in a very crowded office in Manhattan um, and uh, you know, obviously a student came around and, and gave me an electronic board and said we're, we're doing this survey and uh, it'll take about 10 minutes would you mind filling it out and all you have to do is use the electronic pen, you know, and hit certain things, and it's quite painless, and we want to know something about your well-being and who knows what all. So I followed the directions, and, and just as I was bringing it back, a, a gentleman came up to her who'd also been given this, and he said, I do these things for a living, and, and you've got this all wrong. And <laughs> you should throw it all out and start over again, and I'll tell you, and I could just see this poor student, you know, her face went like that. Her whole summer project was going up in smoke, so <laughs> well said. Thank you all so very much, and uh, obviously there are lots more things that people would like to discuss, and that's one of the things to be done over lunch, and uh, Priyanka will give us directions on how we do that. Thank you, Professor Showalter. Um, I'd like, now like to invite Professor Sitaram to please say a few words and close the session. Um, we have kind of reached the first important milestone after the uh, grants were awarded. I know many of the uh, uh, principal investigators must be intensely dialoguing with Priyanka to sign the letters of agreement and to get started. The money is available and it's ready for you to use. Uh, with Professor Showalter's uh, able chairing of the sessions, we have achieved one exercise successfully, I hope, is to let the various groups talk to each other. And one of the research questions are, are things to do, uh, and I am supported ably by Professor Vanujira, Professor Wangangu, and Professor Showalter, is to actually connect these five projects with a web diagram which will at least say what is the big question that together, collectively, all these five are trying to answer. Uh, we have actually got several drawings which we have been working on since the last one month. Today afternoon is one such exercise, is to look at what is the big research question that we can answer. And this is something uh, the President has been asking us and, and we want to try to answer that. And that is of interest to many external parties. Uh, we have successfully scaled up one project, which is the, uh, the project that Professor Chia uh, Kiseng has worked on in, in health. Uh, and how uh, studying diabetes uh, in, in new uh, urban centers will, will actually mean something for the rest of the Asia. And that has been uh, successful in, in becoming a more concrete project on health policy and financing. We hope that such seeds of catalytic uh, potential is there in other projects, individually or collectively. And, and that is something we want to nurture. Um, so we would like uh, this lunch is a lunch, but it's kind of an uh, opportunity to discuss and dialogue. And hopefully after lunch, we, we want to discuss this and uh, we want to shape this further and really want to uh, sharpen the five-year research agenda uh, today in the afternoon. So thank you all very much for this. And these kind of workshops will happen uh, more frequently uh, with your work program now guiding as to how your research progresses. And we want to nurture this dialogue uh, regularly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sitaram. Yeah.